Thor Heyerdahl amazed the world in 1947 when he sailed 4,300 miles across the Pacific on a wooden raft called the Kantiki. A passionate archaeologist, he spent decades traveling the globe and researching how ancient peoples navigated the oceans. Heyerdahl's books have sold upwards of 100 million copies, and he is considered to be one of the greatest explorers of all time. I had the great opportunity of sitting down at the Kantiki Museum in Norway for an interview with his look-alike son, Dr. Thor Heyerdahl Jr., who had a close relationship with his father and traveled with him on one of his expeditions to Easter Island. Dr. Heyerdahl, thanks so much for coming on the History Bites YouTube channel. So I'd like to go over with you some of your father's expeditions and some of the most important points, not only of his life, but of your relationship with him. And so I'd like to start at the very beginning. Why did your dad become excited about science as a boy? Well, uh, my father is a blend, I would say, between being a curious scientist. Uh, everything is interesting. He started off studying biology at the University of Oslo. And uh, that brought him to the island of Fatuhiva in mid-Pacific. Uh, together with my mother, they were newlyweds. And uh, there his interest switched from uh, biology to anthropology. Uh, of course, he uh, was interested in where does all the plants uh, the sparse fauna on this island or these islands come from and where did people come from? So uh, the rest of his life he devoted to finding out the puzzle of where the Polynesians uh, originally came from. Was it from the Asian side of the Pacific or was it from the American side? Your family's descended from the Vikings, is that right? That is right. And your mother, it sounds like she was quite the adventurer herself. My father felt it as an insult to be called uh, an adventurer. Uh, he, he was a serious working artist uh, or, or scientist, but he led an adventurous life, that is for sure. My mother was much more of an adventurer than my father ever was. Uh, so that's a paradox that uh, she, she was really the adventure of the two of them. But they bonded and you and your brother Bjorn came out of that marriage. So where were you when World War II started? When World War II started, I was in Canada and I was a two-year-old kid and the reason why we were in Canada, in British Columbia, was because my father was studying the Northwest Indians. Uh, no, you can't say that. No, they're called First Nations. But then it was proper to call them Northwest Indians. And uh, we were there and wh uh, while my father was undertaking his studies. Uh, but when uh, then uh, his studies got interrupted when the Nazis uh, occupied Norway in uh, April uh, 1940. Uh, so that made it impossible for us to return uh, to Norway before the war was over. But my father volunteered uh, to be trained as a paratrooper uh, in the Norwegian camp uh, Little Norway in uh, outside of Toronto in Ontario uh, and uh, eventually when he was finished his training he was sent overseas uh, first to Scotland and by convoy to Murmansk in Russia and then uh, the rest of the war he together with Russian troops chased the enemy out of the country so we could return uh, home my father without a scar. World War II ended in 1945 and your dad's Kantiki expedition was just a couple years after that. I'm wondering what inspired him at that time 
to take the Kantiki voyage. After his research in British Columbia, uh, my father wrote a thesis about his uh, theories. He was convinced that uh, both North and South American Indians had made it out into the Pacific uh, from British Columbia uh, to Hawaii and even further, perhaps all the way down uh, to New Zealand as Maoris. Uh, and from South America, the Incas, from Peru uh, out in, to the Polynesian uh, islands. And he presented his uh, ideas to a doctor, a professor called Springer at Brooklyn Museum in New York. And he was very impressed by my father's work and uh, the parallels he found on both sides of the Pacific. But uh, he said to my father, as you understand, young man, the Indians neither in Northern nor in South America uh, had any means of transportation, no vessels, no ocean uh, sturdy vessels. Uh, so uh, what you found out is just an example of parallel cultural evolution. My father insisted, yes, uh, when uh, the Spanish conquistadores who crossed the Panamanian Isthmus, they encountered armadas of uh, balsa log rafts that the Indians had sailed all the way from northern Chile, Peru, Ecuador, past uh, Colombia, up uh, to Central America, up and down. Uh, so they were definitely good navigators. Well, you could try yourself to cross uh, the Pacific on a balsa log raft. And that's exactly a challenge that my father took. And together with uh, five friends, he uh, did just that, sailed. It was planned to take 101 days and it took exactly 101 days from Callao in Peru to uh, the coral atoll Eraruia in uh, the Tuamutu group in Polynesia. Why did he call his boat, his, his raft, Kantiki? It's the name of the Inca sun god uh, in Lake Titicaca in South America. So it's named after the sun god. And according to legend, uh, the Incas fled uh, from enemies uh, on rafts sailing towards the sunset. So that's why uh, the Contiki was called Contiki. But your father believed Contiki was real, is that right? And that he lived oh, around yeah. AD 500? Sure. Yeah, exactly. Why didn't Contiki sink in the Pacific Ocean? Why didn't it sink? Well, um, my father insisted that the balsa logs were impregnated by a sap uh, in, in the freshly cut logs. Uh, he thought that uh, if the logs were dry, they would have uh, uh, sucked water and then uh, they uh, probably would have sunk because they cut uh, charge off the logs and they sank. So the water penetrated some way into the logs. But my youngest son, Olav, he repeated the Kontiki uh, expedition many, many, well, that was in 2006, uh, sailing in Kontiki's wakes. And they had uh, dried logs and that floated just as well, so it made no difference whether it was uh, logs impregnated with sap or dried logs. Uh, the dried logs floated like isopore. So that, that was no problem at all. They crossed the Pacific for 101 days, you said. It was from April to August of 1947. And if I recall correctly, it was a 4,300-mile journey. You told me you were living in Lillehammer, Norway, at the time of the voyage. Did you miss your dad while he was away? 
Yes, but uh, we were never afraid. Uh, my mother was never afraid either. She had such faith in my father's ideas, his plan and preparation. And uh, we were, of course, inspired by our mother. So, no, never concerned. Uh, but, of course, uh, all my friends uh, asked, Where, where's your father? Uh, don't you have a father? Well, that could be a little embarrassing for a young boy at times. But uh, I was always proud to say, well, now we just recently picked up telegrams. They used telegrams uh, with Morse alphabet in those days. Uh, I had stories to tell them. Now they've encountered a whale shark. Now they've been through a gale. Now they have landed. Uh, on the Raruya Reef. No, I was never afraid, never concerned. <clears throat> but uh, of course, I've all, always missed my father. But he was always out on some, not only the Contiki expedition, other reed boat expeditions and, and uh, scientific work in, at foreign universities, uh, museums and so forth. So uh, I never really got to know my father closely before I was a member on his expedition to Easter Island in 55 and 56. Then I was enlisted on his expedition vessel as a deck boy. I'd like to zoom in on that expedition, and I know we could spend days zooming in on each one of the journeys your dad took, whether it was to, to Easter Island or on the Ra boat or on the Tigris expedition or in Tacume in Peru, the Galapagos Islands, uh, Tenerife, Spain. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, there's so many. But I'd like to zoom in on that Easter Island expedition. But before I do, I had a couple other questions about Contiki that I was curious about. Was your dad expecting there to be public enthusiasm for his journey, for his adventure? No, I think it was a surprise to him too. <clears throat> So, uh, besides being a successful experiment, uh, the, I think the main reason why uh, the Contique expedition caused such uh, public interest uh, was two things. Firstly, this happened two years after World War II. Uh, the world was all in ruins, fuming ruins and misery and uh, people were occupied by restoration, repairing and recovery from all the misery. And in the midst of all this, here uh, six handsome young men uh, sails on an adventure, uh, landing on a, a presumably Pacific paradise with waving coconut palms and waving hula hip uh, vahines or girls. So this was a dream come true uh, that uh, the world was really uh, hoping for something different uh, to happen. And it, it was a dream come true, uh, really. And also, why should people be interested in whether the Polynesians uh, originally came from the American side or the Asian side of uh, the Pacific. So what? Uh, well, my father made it a de detective story. He was a splendid author and made it fascinating. Uh, and that also in, uh, impressed my father. He was surprised himself too. He knew that he could write, but not that. Uh, the book about the expedition would sell in a hundred million uh, copies, financing the rest of his scientific uh, life. Of, uh, life. Uh, and also, uh, before the departure from Callao in Peru, he was handed a, a Bulex 16mm camera. He'd never uh, touched a film camera in his life before. And then he makes a documentary and wins the uh, Hollywood uh, Oscar Award for the best documentary 
in the year of uh, 51. And of course, the first uh, movie my father had ever recorded, and he wins an Oscar <coughs> that becomes a world sensation as well. That was also uh, a surprise to my father. But again, an example of his uh, artistic, artistic senses that he knew how to uh, tell a story, write a story, to film and photograph uh, and convey the, uh, these uh, events uh, to the general public. So besides being a curious scientist, I admire my father for being an artist. You talked about his popular books. I'd like to run through some of his expeditions after the Contiki voyage. This book, Aku Aku, that Dr. Heyerdahl, uh, Thor Heyerdahl wrote about the Easter Island expedition, you were on, as you were saying a minute ago. So could, can you tell us a little bit, why were you going to Easter Island, and what, what memories do you have with your dad from that time? Uh, as I just said, it was on that expedition that I really got to know my own father, because then we spent every day together. I admire him for being an excellent expedition leader. He had experience from the war by handling uh, fellow soldiers, uh, taking orders, passing on orders, and uh, knew uh, how to use this experience uh, leading an expedition. So uh, I was uh, proud of being my father's son uh, on that uh, expedition, but I never wanted to be regarded as a son. I wanted to be regarded as uh, a sailor, a deck boy, just like a sailor like the others uh, of the uh, crew. Uh, so I tried to avoid my father as much as, as I could, but still I did uh, have good contact with him though. Uh, and uh, ever since, um, well, I never wanted to follow in my father's uh, footsteps, uh, so I, I avoided archaeology and anthropology, but I loved the sea. I've been a professional sa sailor for some years also before I switched to uh, studying marine biology and oceanography. And uh, after I graduated, uh, I advised my father on his uh, expedition with reed drafts. Uh, crossing the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Uh, so, and he wanted me to come along, but uh, I uh, turned that down. Now being the son of a, an expedition leader, that, that, that's awkward for both generations. But uh, we cooperated for many years, and uh, I can insist that I'm the best friend my father ever had, and vice versa. I never had a better friend than my own father. What were some of his really good qualities that you look back on and remember? He experienced so much, had a very adventurous life, but never got spoiled. Uh, he was, well, I've been, been with him on top of the rim of uh, the volcano of Vesuvius uh, outside of Naples. And to experience that with him, I myself, uh, I have some geology in my curriculum, uh, to experience looking down into the fuming crater, uh, how he experienced uh, that moment, uh, that I admired him so much for that. He lived, he, he never became spoiled. Uh, or meals, uh, well, well, any pressure that uh, life can provide you with, uh, I admired him for that. And it was so much fun to experience things together with him. When I, I read how he has uh, recorded these experiences in his books, sometimes I remember, Jay, did I 
join him on that uh, trip. And I was surprised, yeah, yeah, well, that's how he experienced it and how he tells it. And it, every, I corrected every uh, uh, sentence. Everything was true, colored by his way of experiencing it. Him being a, uh, an author again, with an author's imagination. That leads me, I have a few questions to zoom in on some of your dad's expeditions after Contiki. I'm curious, as, as an aside about the Easter Island trip, what does Aku Aku mean? It's uh, your other, well, your spiritual, uh, the, the part of your spirit that sometimes uh, leave your mind and your heart and walk beside you and advises you, do this, do that. Uh, it's uh, the other you, it's part of you, but sometimes you can communicate with yourself. That it's a spirit, that's what it's a human spirit. Sorry, that's, that's what the Polynesians believe? Yes, especially Easter Island is an aku aku. So if you have a good aku aku, you're very fortunate. Yeah, my father had a good Aku Aku, and I'm happy with mine as well. In his book, Aku Aku, he writes a few different times about you during that expedition. One of the things he says is that you slept on the volcano Arango for yeah. four months. Yeah. Is that, is that true? Yes, uh, we spent six months on the island, and the two first months uh, I spent together with the rest of the expedition crew in our camp in the Bay of Anakena in a tent. Uh, but the last four months uh, I was uh, secretary or assistant uh, for one of the American uh, professors and uh, he lived down in the village. Uh, but uh, I prefer to live on top of the volcano Rano Kao, it's called, and uh, there was a uh, village ruin called Orongo, as you said. Uh, and um, I helped him uh, map uh, the ruin uh, village. Uh, and uh, the, the natives were, were frightened by that I, I lived all alone up on uh, with, with the old spirits and uh, uh, they thought that was really risky. They were afraid that I would never come alive down again. But <laughs> yeah, and I was, I was a happy young man up there, all by myself. Free. You studied, you, you, you and your dad's team studied the famous statues on the island. You studied caves. You studied the different topography or the landscapes on the island. What, what did he learn while doing those excavations on Easter Island that was significant? Uh, we discovered through talks with the elders who had inherited legends from their forefathers and foremothers. Uh, so it was surprising how much the locals knew about their own history. Uh, and my father was so surprised. Why haven't you told earlier visitors uh, everything you tell me? Well, nobody ever asked us. So if you want a question, no, if you want an answer, you have to uh, come out with your question. My father was curious, he asked, and he got a lot of information. So we found out by experiments also how the statues were carved out from the mountainside, uh, how uh, they were transported uh, vertically, like you and me would move a refrigerator in place, tilting it from side to side. We did that as an experiment successfully. Uh, so uh, many of the mysteries of the island were solved even on that expedition. But no proof of 
where the islanders had originally come from and that was really what my father mostly uh, searched for. Uh, I graduated from the University of Oslo uh, with a fellow student who later became a professor of uh, medical genetics at the University of Oslo. Uh, he has made an expedition to Easter Island and taken samples, uh, blood samples of locals uh, who can trace their ancestry back to uh, prehistoric uh, times. And he has found a genetic DNA proof of South American origin on Easter Island. Uh, Polynesia. Father, that has been... Yeah. Uh, and my, that, this was done many, many years after my father passed away. But before too long, I, a little long, I, I'm no hurry, but when I'm uh, hopefully reunited with my father, I look forward to telling Papa, uh, my uh, fellow student, uh, he found proof that you were right. It was published in, your, in the American uh, scientific uh, magazine, the foremost scientific magazine in the world, Nature, uh, accepted there. So it's beyond discussion. Your, the main ideas of your theory of a contact between South America and Polynesia has been proven right. No discussion. So the whole reason he traveled on the Contiki has been vindicated. Now, yes. Right. I'm ha looking forward to tell my father that. I'm sure. <laughs> His, about 15 years after you went on that Easter Island trip with him, he took the Ra expeditions. What was your father's objective? What was he trying to accomplish with then, this? He was just uh, curious. Uh, he knew that the use of reed boats was common in, uh, in the Nile on uh, some of the Mediterranean islands along the coast of Morocco and even in uh, the Caribbean in Central America, above all Lake Titicaca uh, between uh, Bolivia and Peru, uh, could there be a connection? He had no, he was just curious. Uh, could it have been possible to cross the Atlantic on a reed boat? Uh, so uh, back in, uh, when was it? 69? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, he, with an international crew, he sailed with his first reed boat, made it almost to Barbados, one week short of Barbados. But then uh, so much seawater had penetrated into the uh, reeds uh, and the ropes, it was poorly lashed together by locals from Lake Chad in central uh, Sahara. Uh, so they, the crew wanted to continue, but my father being responsible uh, insisted that no, we uh, we desert the boat here and we repeat uh, the experiment next year. So uh, uh, they did and repeated the uh, expedition next year with the RAW 2. That was uh, again a papyrus uh, tied together by Aymara Indians from Lake Titicaca and they were excellent boat Builders, so they tied it properly together. So they came success, just proving how easy it was. No trouble at all, no, no drama. But uh, three years after uh, the first Ra expedition, I was an ass assistant professor uh, in marine biology and oceanography up at, uh, at a college in Nor Northern Norway, locally known as an expert on sea life. 
and uh, a local fisherman uh, came to me with a two meter long straw uh, that was washed ashore on the outer Lofoten Islands and asked me, Heidel, what is this? I've never seen the likes before. Uh, and I recognized it immediately. Uh, it had a triangular uh, cross section and lashes, uh, uh, traces of the lashes, uh, lashes of, of ropes. So it was uh, papyrus from the raw that had continued from where they left it, uh, sailed uh, between the uh, Windward Islands into the Caribbean, uh, then again between Mexico, Yucatan and Cuba into the Gulf of Mexico, squeezed out between Florida and Cuba, uh, caught by the Gulf Stream and brought and three uh, across the Atlantic. Three years later, washed ashore in uh, Arctic Norway, proving that uh, ocean currents exist, that they, they wash the continents if something fall, uh, drifts from shore in one continent, it will, if it floats, end up on the other side of the ocean. Uh, so the problem with the first row was just that it was poorly lashed together. So uh, that was a, uh, a fantastic uh, experience that I, of course, told my father that was when he still was alive. And that pleased him. Tremendously, of course. I'll bet it did. Yeah. If I recall correctly, the first raw boat had no rope going from its stern or, right. or backside yeah. down to the, the floor. To the, right. To the floor, to, to hold it and to keep the stern, the back, and the bow, the front up out of the water. Yeah. The first boat, if I recall correctly, had no rope. So over time, the weight yes. of the re curved in reeds. Yes pulled the backside of yeah. the boat down into the water. And function as a beach, literally that, that the, the water washed uh, over the papyrus and that uh, uh, well soaked the, the reeds, but they still, it still floated though, but uh, it made it very difficult to maneuver it. And, but the main problem was that, uh, uh, that um, uh, it, it fell more or less apart, that it was not strongly enough lashed together. That was the main problem. But they, had they, and they, they wouldn't have survived a hurricane. And this was short time before the hurricane season. Uh, so without a hurricane, they probably would have made it but my father didn't want to take that risk. But with his second raw expedition, no problem at all. And about eight years later, he took another reed boat voyage, the Tigris expedition. Yeah. Where did the name, where does the name Tigris come from for this? The ship? name comes from the river uh, Tigris in uh, present-day Iraq uh, in the old days um, Mesopotamia uh, the two rivers uh, Euphrates and Tigris they merge and flow together uh, into the Persian Gulf uh, in um, Basra present-day Basra that in biblical times was considered uh, Eden, the Garden of Eden, paradise. Uh, now it's certainly not a paradise anymore. It's ruined by local warfare. Uh, and then they sailed out the Persian Gulf through the Strait of Hormuz uh, over to Pakistan and then from Karachi uh, across the Indian Ocean uh, to uh, Oman. And, but there they got entangled in local law uh, warfare uh, that uh, you Americans and we Europeans, we furnish the local tribes with uh, terrible uh, weaponry. Uh, 
uh, and make big money on selling uh, that kind of equipment to these people and protesting against the local rogue uh, warfare that uh, uh, enabled the expedition to continue down the uh, east coast of Africa. They put the raw, uh, no the Tigris fire uh, as a protest uh, and uh, uh, sent uh, complaints to Secretary General Utant uh, in those days that the reason why they did this. They sailed not with the Norwegian flag, but with the blue United Nations flag and got a lot of attention, intention because of that. And that was his, well, it was, you can say that it was uh, successful after all. They sailed out the Persian Gulf and across the whole Indian Ocean. But uh, as an oceanographer, I can easily say that uh, had they been able to continue, they could have sailed with the Agullus current down the east coast of Africa, around the uh, Cape of Good Hope from the opposite direction of the explorers uh, and get uh, help from the Anguilla, no, Benguela current coming up from the Arctic, bringing them up uh, to the South Equatorial current and bringing them across the Atlantic. Maybe they can could have ended up in uh, Central America too, just like the raw. But um, that remains undone. Speculation. What motivated your dad to go on that expedition? Curiosity. Just there were things that similarities that puzzled him. Could it be possible? Reed boats are used on either side of the the ocean. Could there have been a connection? And uh, well, that that was he said that. Uh, his, my life is not long enough to, to uh, uh, pursue the, these theories, but younger generations have the opportunity. I've just proved that it, it was possible. Your dad, even when everyone said, you're wrong, you're going to die, he was so convinced that he went through with his Kantiki expedition anyway, along with his other voyages. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But I think it's important to note that he had done a significant amount of work before he went on these adventures, studying and researching. And as we talked about earlier, he wasn't just a daredevil. And he was definitely not a daredevil. He couldn't even swim during the Kontiki expedition. My father almost drowned as a young kid, and he was scared of water. So. Uh, he hadn't even learned how to swim during the Kontiki expedition. He learned it later. He taught me to dive, so he overcame it. But he was certainly not a daredevil, but he had faith in his uh, uh, ideas, his theories, and his ability. So uh, uh, he, he was always convinced that uh, I don't even need to undertake these expeditions uh, because my theories are so sound. But uh, I must say, I'm not an adventurer, he said, but uh, I think it's fun. Uh, drifting across the world oceans, uh, uh, bringing me away from deadlines, from uh, bills, from uh, quarrelsome uh, scientific colleagues. <laughs> So uh, he was so happy on his expeditions, even before he learned how to swim. So I know this must be sad and difficult for you to think about. How long have your parents been gone for now? Uh, now my daughter, our present director of this museum, is as old as my mother was when she passed away. Uh, she was married the second time with an American, and they lived in Maine, married to the Rockefeller family. Uh, and uh, she was 53, 
And that was very sad. I was there to say goodbye. Uh, and I remember we sat, I knew this was the first night we had together. We sat bedside uh, and uh, had a meal of turkey, uh, drinking uh, red wine. And I remember she was so weak, so she couldn't even lift her glass. So my brother, he's, I'm a big, strong man. He's even big, or used to be even bigger and stronger. And with his hairy chimpanzee fist, aided his mother and helped her to moisten her lips. That is perhaps the most touching moment of my life. I've had others too, but to say goodbye, mom, thank you for everything. And... Uh, uh, farewell and sail well and uh, and she died with a smile too so and same thing with my father I sat bedside with him too that's uh, that was in 2002 he was uh, in his early 80s younger than I am now uh, but that was not he was older so uh, uh, and he was so happy with the life he, he'd led. So uh, it was um, uh, sentimental, uh, but not sad. It, that's the way we all go. So uh, I, I said with a smile, I have a, have a good uh, voyage and uh, uh, wherever you land, somewhere I'm sure you will land. And uh, we said farewell with a smile to each other. So, uh, yeah, my mother's farewell was very sad. My, if you can say that my father's farewell was, was happy. Yes, it was. And you're 84 now, is that yeah. right? Yeah, so next time is my time. Hmm. How do you occupy your time nowadays? I occupy my time by where well, I'm the lucky, the uh, um, I've inherited a, a piece of land near the Swedish border, a forest. So I'm a happy lap, uh, lumberjack. I'm sure not many can beat me arm wrestling. <laughs> uh, so well trained. Uh, so yes, that's my uh, uh, answer. Besides, I'm a, a senior scientist scientist here at this museum. Uh, in the winter, with the snow, I'm uh, very fond of skiing, cross-country uh, skiing. So, uh, I am a happy fa father of three adult children and eight grandchildren, enjoying that very much. And uh, in between, showing people around in this museum, uh, like you, on this occasion, other occasions, I've been guest speaker in, uh, on National Geographic expeditions uh, around Greenland, along the Spitsbergen Islands, in this uh, Azores, uh, the Canary Islands, Madeira, and so forth. So uh, I'm, always, I'm always busy. I don't really have time to go to bed at night. <laughs> well, but I have sweet dreams. Keeps you moving. Well, you, you're an extraordinary man, Dr. Heyerdahl. Your father was an extraordinary man. Your mother was extraordinary. You have just an amazing family. It's, it's not just hyperbole to say that. And it's been an honor to chat with you. Wonderful to meet with you. Thanks for sharing memories of your dad. and some of your own experiences in your career. I appreciate it very much. And to everyone watching, if you haven't subscribed to the History Bites YouTube channel yet, please do so below. And you can see a video that I made about the Kantiki expedition here in Norway, also linked in the description. And until next time, go learn your history.